Bom dia a todos. Uh, good morning, everybody. Bem, uh, eu vou fazer uma breve apresentação em português, depois vou passar tudo, tudo passará a ser tido em inglês, né? mas pelo que eu entendi vai haver uma transmissão simultânea, uma tradução simultânea para os que estão uh, escutando. Tá? Uh, so, good morning, welcome everybody. We are here beginning the second session of our 11th meeting on the origins of contemporary philosophy. Uh, this year, as is known in its uh, in a online fashion, and uh, our conference today will be given by Professor Chiara Russo Kraus uh, and uh, on Joseph Petzold and the systematization of Ernest Mach philosophy. Uh, Professor Kraus is Russo Kraus is uh, has a doctorate from the University of uh, University of Napoli, Federico II, uh, and his doc her doctorate was on uh, the structure and genesis of Richard Avenarius Thought, and she has also a master's degree from the same university. She was also a fellow in the Erasmus Fellowship from the European Union in 2005. Uh, in which he attended for research the Ludwig Maximilian Universität in Munich, in Munich. And now she's a researcher at the same university, University Federico II at Napoli. And her research uh, that has pretty much, very much in common with our uh, objects of research here also, uh, comprises German philosophy of 19th century, positivism, Neocantianism, and the history and philosophy of psych psychology. Uh, she has published, uh, among many other uh, articles, a book on Wundt and Avenarius, a debate on scientific psychology at the turn of the century, and uh, has written the forthcoming article on Richard Avenarius for the Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, we uh, have uh, well, uh, one hour and a half, uh, roughly, for her presentation. Uh, after that, I will be giving some comments uh, on, the, on the presentation. We cannot, unfortunately, have the questions uh, made by the assistant, by the audience, but I will try to make it uh, profitable. OK. So the screen uh, froze, but uh, I hope uh, you can hear me and uh, see me. So uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening. Since we are in different uh, time zones, uh, it's better to cover all the options. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to have this presentation. And uh, I'm sorry not to be there in Brazil to meet uh, you and the other lecturers in person but uh, I hope we could uh, still profit uh, from this occasion. So if you see me now, I'm going to share my screen so you can see the presentation. So I hope you see the presentation. And uh, as you already heard, the title of my talk is uh, Joseph Petzold and the Systematization of Ernest Mach Philosophy. Of course, the name of Ernest Mach is well known in the history of philosophy. Joseph Petzold, on the other end, is a less known figure, to say the least. So chances are that uh, your first question when reading this title was, uh, who is this Petzold guy? And more importantly, why should I spend almost an hour and a half of my life uh, hearing a talk uh, about him? Now, I don't know the life choices that brought you here today in front of your screen to hear this talk, so I cannot answer this question. What I can answer is the question regarding who was Petzold, why he matters for the knowledge of Ernest Mach, and maybe for the knowledge of a certain period in the history of philosophy. Now, to answer these questions, I'm going to start near the end and then go back in time and follow the story from the beginning. So I want to start from the 1910s uh, in the city of Berlin. At this time, Josef Petzold is a 50 years old professor who teaches as a private docent at Berlin Technisches Universität. 
This means that uh, his academic career has not been very fortunate uh, since a private docent uh, is not a very stable position. However, he's an active and well-known figure in the philosophical and scientific community of the city. In particular, he is a fervent supporter of the philosophy of Ernest Mach, and he has published several books and papers on philosophical issues. Moreover, Petzl is the founder and president of the Society for Positivist Philosophy, a place where philosophers and scientists can meet and discuss issues regarding epistemology and the new advances of science. This Berlin Society counts hundreds of members, and among them there are some very important figures, such as uh, the psychologist Sigmund Freud, the mathematician David Hilbert, the positivist historian Karl Lamprecht, the evolutionary biologist Willem Roux, and the young physicist Albert Einstein. Now, speaking of Einstein, in 1914, Einstein had moved to Berlin to become a member of the Prussian Academy of Science and a professor at Berlin University. Two years, two years later, in 1916, Ernest Mach died after being sick for a long time. Einstein himself wrote a eulogy that acknowledged his profound depth to Mach. In particular, the death of Mach made Petzold the main living representative of Machian philosophy in Germany. So during this decade, he became the first and foremost advocate of Ernest Mach. And in particular, he defended the thesis that there is an inherent bond between Machian philosophy and the new theory of relativity. Petzl brought about the topic of relativity as early as 1914, when he published on the relativity theory of physics, which made him the second philosopher after the Neocantian Paul Natorp to deal with the topic of relativity. But Petzl returned on the subject of the, of the philosophical interpretation of Einstein's theory in countless essays and even books till his death in 1929. However, I only mentioned this one paper from 1914 because it stands out since it was praised by Einstein himself. In fact, when Einstein moved to Berlin, he was requested to write an article by the popular newspaper Vossische Zeitung to present his theory to the public. In this article, after exposing his theory in brief, Einstein affirms that uh, such a short article is no place for a lengthy discussion of the epistemological implications of relativity. So for this reason, he suggests the reader to refer either to Petzold or to a paper by the physicist Emil Kohn to have a further insights into the epistemological implications of relativity. So this is already a proof that Petzold had a certain reputation in the philosophical debate about relativity. He was respected by Einstein himself, and they also visited each other multiple times in Berlin. Moreover, in the following years, all the main representatives of the debate on relativity all discuss Petzl's position on the topic. I'm talking of uh, Moritz Schlick, Hans Kassirer, Hans Reichenbach, just to name the works by the most important philosophers of that era where you can find a discussion of Petzl's ideas. However, I don't want to talk about the role of Petzl in the debate about relativity. That's not the topic of my talk today. I just wanted to introduce you to Petzold at the time that he was at the height of his career, so to speak. So after this brief overview of the situation during the 1910s, we can say to have established some facts about Petzold. At that time, Petzold had a well-established position in the German philosophical landscape. He was a self-declared representative of Machian philosophy and he was also acknowledged as such by his peers in the philosophical community. And he acted as the main representative of Machian philosophy, especially in the debate on relativity. However, we don't know anything about his ideas yet, except for the fact that he was a supporter of Ernest Mach. Now, assuming that we do know what were the ideas of Ernest Mach, it's quite obvious that uh, the philosophy of Petzold cannot overlap 100% with his master. So we should talk about uh, Joseph Petzold in his individuality first. Then, once we know what was the philosophy of Petzold, we can compare it to the ideas of Mach. And by doing so, we will know what was specific of Petzold and what he shared with Mach. 
And that's even more important because uh, even if you're not interested in Petzold, uh, which is uh, kind of understandable, if we know what they agree upon, this can help us to shed light on the philosophy of Mack himself. And in particular, I think that Petzold can help us answer the question whether Mack was a phenomenalist or not. So after having answered briefly to the question, who was Josef Petzold? I will now move on to the next question. What was his philosophy? But in order to answer this question, we should ask first, what questions drove him? Because if we want to understand the philosopher, we should always start from the problems that haunted him. We should ask ourselves, what were the problems that he was trying to address? Now, to find out what were the problems that Petzl was trying to address with his philosophy, we must go back in time and look at his intellectual formation. In a short autobiographical piece, Petzl himself speaks about the position he held when he was a university student at the beginning of his philosophical journey. In that short autobiography, he says that he was basically neo-Kantian and agnostic. So my first task is to clarify this statement. What does it mean for a man in the second half of the 19th century to be a neo-Kantian and agnostic? We have a hint by looking at the books that Petzl himself lists as his first philosophical readings. Unsurprisingly, he mentions Kant's prolegomena, then Ludwig Buchanan, Force and Matter, which was one of the milestones of German materialism of the 19th century. Then he lists Darwin Origins of Species, then Friedrich Albert Lange, History of Materialism, which was uh, one of the most read uh, and influential books of the time. In this book, Lange defended the form of neo-Kantianism that was kind of updated to meet the new discoveries in the field of physiology of the sensory perceptions. Then last but not least, Petzl named Emile Dubois-Raymond the limits of science, which is the famous speech where Dubois-Raymond declares the ignorabimus. According to Dubois-Raymond, there are things that uh, we do not know now, things that we ignore, but science will be able to discover these things in the future. And on the other end, there are things that uh, we do not know now, but that uh, we will never know, even in the most remote future. Things that we ignore and will ignore, ignoramus et ignorabimus. According to Dubois-Raymond, these things that uh, we will never know are First, the ultimate meaning of matter and force. And secondly, how can consciousness arise from matter? Now, these readings were not particularly original. On the contrary, all these books were like a must read for a young man interested in philosophy and science in the second half of the 19th century. So we may even say that they sketch what was the standard way of thinking for the educated people especially in scientific circles. They form a sort of a common sense philosophy for scientists and intellectuals. We may say that this common way of thinking was the result of two fundamental trends. The first trend had its root in the so-called second scientific revolution. I'm referring to a series of processes that began in the late 18th century and then exploded during the 19th century the process of industrialization, the advances in sciences like chemistry, the discoveries in the field of electromagnetism, the formulation of the law of conservation of energy, not least the already mentioned publication of Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection, and the development of the new experimental physiology. Now, what matters for us is that all these scientific advances contributed to a resurgence of the idea that living beings are not a distinct natural realm. Living organisms are not characterized by some peculiar vital force that is able to pursue final causes that aims at goals. According to the worldview that resulted from this second scientific revolution, living beings work according to the same law of the physical world. Living beings may be explained thanks to chemistry, electricity, and more generally, 
thanks to physical laws and according to the principle of conservation of energy. So there is no mysterious life that animates them. So this scientific revolution fueled a renaissance of the materialistic worldview. The world, and I repeat, the world including all living beings, plants, animals, and humans, is made of matter and energy, which remain constant and operate according to the necessary laws. This is the first trend that characterized German culture around the half of the century. Now, this trend was accompanied by a second trend that may appear opposite to this first, but it is not necessarily so. I'm talking of Neocantianism, of the so-called back to Kant movement. Now, I'm going to make some simplifications because I cannot enter in the details and I'm not talking about the philosophy of any specific thinker. So I beg your pardon in advance if my sketch of this trend will sound pretty rough. I just want to describe the prevalent way of thinking, or we may even say a philosophical mood that was common for educated people in the second half of the 19th century. Okay, so the core of this Neocantianism was the Copernican revolution. So the idea that we cannot know the world in itself because all knowledge starts and ends with consciousness. So we cannot grasp anything beyond our representations, beyond our consciousness. This means that science doesn't deal with the way the world really is. Science is rather the result of the functioning of our minds. Therefore, science and knowledge have inherent limits that depends upon the way we think. But beyond the knowledge and beyond those limits, there might be room for what the science cannot grasp things like uh, free will or values uh, and so on. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but we can say that this second trend was characterized by an idealist worldview, according to which we cannot know anything about the world in itself, about the mind independent reality. And therefore, we only deal with our representations, with what's in our consciousness. I want to stress once more that uh, this materialist trend and this idealist trend are not necessarily opposed to each other. On the contrary, they often went hand in hand because the materialist worldview was regarded as the ideal goal of the scientific understanding of the world. So even the Neocantians could agree that we must explain all natural phenomena, including living beings in terms of mechanical, physical processes in terms of matter and energy. But they also thought that ultimately, we do not know what is the substance of the world, what are matter and energy, because we only grasp them indirectly through our representations. Now, I say that Petzold at first regarded himself as Neocantian and agnostic, which means that he shared this understanding of the world according to which we must strive for a materialist mechanist explanation of the world, even though we must suspend judgment about the ultimate features of the world, because we only know the world indirectly through its mirroring in our experience. And ultimately, we only have our experience, our representations. However, Petzl soon became dissatisfied with this worldview for a number of reasons. First, for its very agnosticism, the idea that we must give up the task of really knowing the world. Second, for its uh, subjectivism, because Petzl couldn't agree with the idea that uh, we are confined uh, into our representations. Third, for its underlying dualism, according to which uh, there's uh, the world in itself on the one hand, and our consciousness, our representations on the other end. And because this dualism meant a split in our understanding of the world, but also in our understanding of ourselves, giving rise to the mind-body problem of the interaction between these two worlds. So during his philosophical career, Petzl always aimed at solving these problems. He aimed at a positivist philosophy that had the courage to state a positive knowledge of the world that wasn't afraid to say 
the world is actually so and so. He aimed at a realist philosophy that did not regard our experience as a sheer subjective representation devoid of any ability to grasp the reality of things. And he aimed at the unitary understanding of the world, which had to provide a framework also capable of explaining away the mind-body problem. So these were the, pro the philosophical goals of Petzold. These were the questions that drove him, the problems that he was trying to solve. Therefore, now we have answered the second question and we can move forward and try to understand what was the philosophy of Petzold and how it differed from this neo-Kantian and agnostic philosophy that he held at the beginning of his career. In particular, Petzl believed that he had found a different philosophy in the works of three authors, Ernest Mach, Richard Avenarius, and Gustav Theodor Fechne. Those were the authors that woke him from his neo-Kantian agnostic slumber, so to speak. These authors provided Petzl with the first stones for his philosophical system, which can be found in the earlier works of Petzl, like on Richard Avenarius' principle of the least amount of energy and maxim meanings and economy. Petzl read in particular three works by, three, by these authors. Some ideas on the history and creation uh, history of creation and evolution of the organism by Fechner, the science of mechanics by Mach, and philosophy as thinking of the world in accordance with the principle of the least amount of energy by Avenarius. In these works, Petzl found three principles that he regarded as related to each other. Fechner principle of tendency towards stability, Mach principle of economy of thought, and of an Aris principle of the least amount of energy. Fechner's stability principle claims that uh, due to the effects of internal forces, all closed or relatively closed systems tend towards stable states, which are states that remain the same or periodically return to the same state. According to Fechner, this principle applies both to organic and inorganic systems, and ultimately to the universe itself, as long as we can consider the universe as an all-encompassing system. Regarding Avenarius and Mach, Petzl treats their principles of the least amount of energy and of photo economy as if they are the same. Now, we don't have the time to discuss the differences between these two principles because we are more interested in Petzl's interpretation of the ideas of Mach and Avenarius. So I will stick to what Petzl says, even though I know that there exist some differences in these two principles. However, according to Petzl, both Avenarius and Mach explain mental processes through an economical principle. In particular, this principle states that in cognitive processes, we apply those concepts that carry out the greatest performance with the least use of energy. For the same reason, we tend to develop all encompassing concepts that can be used to sum up a great deal of information. However, as I said, we are not interested in the details of these principles. So let's see what matters for us. We say that Fechner's stability principle applies to the organic and the inorganic world alike. Mach and Avenarius principles, on the other end, describe the cognitive processes, uh, mental activity. Now, Petzl reunites these three principles to forge a unitary principle that can be applied to the inanimate world, to living beings, and to mental activity. And he calls this principle the principle of tendency towards stability or of the minimum disruptions. According to this principle, when a variation occurs to a system, the system reduces this disruption to a minimum until it reaches a state of stability. And in so doing, by reducing the disruptions, all systems tend to states of increased stability. For an example of this principle, we can consider the solar system. The solar system is a stationary system insofar as all its components periodically return to the same state. 
Now, if we imagine that the foreign celestial body arise from outside the system, it will cause some disruptions, some variations in the usual trajectories of the planets of the solar system. But eventually, the new celestial body will attain its own regular orbit, and the planets too will have adjusted their orbits according to the presence of this new element. The planets will have regained a regular course, either the same orbit they had before or a new orbit. So in a sense, the planet system evolved to elaborate and encompass this uh, disturbing element. And by reducing the disruption to a minimum, he restated a state of stability. But as we said, according to Petzold, that follows Fechner on the topic, the same principle applies also to living beings. For example, in the metabolic processes, where the system maintains its ability by constantly elaborating nutritive substances. But the principle of stability or of the minimum disruptions applies also to mental activity. In fact, we elaborate new information that are like disturbing elements through usual concepts, through familiar ideas, or by developing new user concepts by familiarizing with these new ideas. And in so doing, we reduce the, the disturbing elements and regain stability. And this process also drives the evolution of all knowledge. However, again, all technicalities aside, what matters to us is that in this principle of stability, we already recognize those drives that we identified earlier as the problems that Petzo wanted to address with this philosophy. Because the principle of stability presents itself as a positive knowledge of the world, in the sense that it presents itself as a scientific generalization that describes the real features of the world, not as some kind of regulative idea that only serves to organize our representations in Kantian agnostic sense. Moreover, this principle provides a unitary understanding of the world because we have one principle that applies to all reality, from celestial bodies to plants, animals, human beings, and human knowledge itself. Therefore, human knowledge is not some separate domain anymore with its own rules, like happened in transcendental philosophy. Human knowledge is a part of the world that is bound by the same principle of the rest of the world. So we now have the first pillar of Petzl's philosophical system that will remain in place till the end and throughout his intellectual evolution. Now, the second pillar is the so-called principle of Eindeutigkeit, which can be translated as a principle of uniqueness or even more precisely, as a principle of univocalness. Petzl develops this notion in an influential paper published in 1895 called precisely the law of univocalness. Now, to explain the role of univocalness in Petzl's system, we may say that it plays a role similar to the principle of stability. In fact, Petzl aimed at overcoming the metaphysical anthropomorphic account of finality and causality. In the case of finality, the anthropomorphism consists in the idea that nature sets ends and chooses the proper means to reach them. So it is an anthropomorphism because we think that nature acts like a person that makes decision as if an intelligent free being shapes his own future towards a certain goals. According to Petzold, the principle of stability, first established by Fechner, overcomes this erroneous anthropomorphic account by focusing on the objective outcomes of processes instead. Therefore, the principle of stability has nothing to do with the metaphysical finalism, because it simply reports what is the actual conclusion, the necessary outcome of natural processes, which are stable states. In the case of causality, the anthropomorphism consists in the idea that the cause acts on the effect, and the effect is therefore like forced to do something due to the command of the cause. 
So it is an anthropomorphism because the cause is sort of a master and the effect is sort of a slave. Now, the question is, how can we overcome this erroneous account of causality? Of course, the criticism of causality was far from novel. We may mention Hume, Comte, Helmholtz, Dubois-Raymond, Kirchhoff, or the already mentioned Fechner, Mack, and Avenarius, just to name a few thinkers that already criticized causality for similar reasons. All these thinkers criticized the naive metaphysical anthropomorphic notion of causality. But let us just focus on Fechner, Mack, and Avenarius that we already acknowledged as the direct forerunners of Petzold. These three thinkers claimed that the metaphysical notion of causality had to be replaced by the notion of functional relations. Instead of the idea of a mysterious force that the cause passes on the effect, forcing it to act in a certain way, we should stick to the simple observable fact that there are relations among natural phenomena. And these relations may be expressed in equations that connect functionally certain quantitative parameters of natural phenomena, such as mass, acceleration, heat, and so on. In so doing, Fechner, Mack, and Avenarius were updating the principle of causality and at the same time, they were addressing the recent formulation of the law of conservation of energy. Because the law of conservation does not say that there is some mysterious metaphysical substance called energy that cannot increase nor diminish. The law of conservation of energy says that it is possible to formulate equations, to formulate functions, to find mathematical fixed ratios between certain quantitative features of phenomena in such a way that we are able to calculate that when a certain variable has a certain value, then the other related variable will change accordingly. To use the words of Mach himself, the law of causality is identical with the supposition that between natural phenomena alpha, beta, gamma, certain equations subsist. Now, Petzold agrees with Fechner, Mack, and Avenarius, or at least he agrees uh, up to a certain point, because he also thinks that uh, this account of causality has one major flaw, insofar as it leaves room to a certain degree of uh, indeterminism. The problem is that functional relations uh, at least as Fechner, Avenarius, and Mach meant them, do not express what must happen. They do not express the necessity of the course of nature. Rather, they simply affirm that there are certain relations among what actually happens. For example, when we have a certain set of conditions alpha, there is no necessary determinate outcome. There are various possible outcomes, and the functional relation only states that among the conditions and the possible outcome that will actually occur, there must be certain fixed relations between certain quantitative parameters. So if the case beta occurs, there are some functional relations between alpha and beta. If the case gamma occurs, there are some functional relations between alpha and gamma, and so on. But the functional relations do not determine what must happen between beta, gamma, and so on. So there are always multiple possible outcomes. And this indeterminacy is not just something that wasn't addressed directly by Fechner, Avenarius, and Mack, because they explicitly defended this indeterministic conception. For example, let's read this word by Mach that come right after the bit I already read before. Max says, if the number of the equations were greater than or equal to the number of the alpha, beta, gamma, all the alpha, beta, gamma would be thereby overdetermined or at least completely determined. However, the fact of the very of nature proves that the number of the equations is less than that of the alpha, beta, gamma. But with this, a certain indefiniteness in nature remains behind. It may not be unimportant for the investigator of nature to consider and recognize 
the indetermination which the law of causality leaves over. On the contrary, unlike Fechner, Avenarius and Mach, Pezzo thinks that natural phenomena must be completely determined. This means that causality must work so that only one outcome is determined by the conditions. This means that the real case is unique, literally speaking. And it is precisely to highlight this feature of nature that Petzl formulates his law of univocalness. This law states that the real case is unique among the infinite possible ones. And for this reason, for every process, it is possible to find such means of determination that only that one process is laid down. In other words, we must investigate the natural phenomena so as to find some means of determination, like measurement, the quantitative parameters, and so on, that are capable of describing the real case as something unique. Let's take, for example, the law of the parallelogram of forces. We have a billiard ball that is traveling at a certain speed and gets hit by another ball. Now, the question is, what will happen? Potentially, we may imagine infinite possible trajectories, multiple possible outcomes. The ball may continue moving forward, or it might take whatever direction. It might even go backward. But for Petzl, nature cannot take whatever course. The course of nature cannot be open to multiple outcomes. It cannot be plurivocal, indeterminate, equivocal. The conditions must determine only one outcome. And in fact, the real case is unique, and it is univocally determined by the existing conditions. And for this reason, we can find means of determination that point univocally to the real case. For example, in the law of the parallelogram, the vectors are such means of determination. Since there is only one diagonal, through the law of the parallelogram, the trajectory is described univocally. So the real trajectory of the moving ball, the trajectory that the ball must take, it's univocally determined. Now, as you might have already noticed, the Petzl law of univocalness has two phases. On the one end, it is a metaphysical principle that the states that phenomena are univocally determined, meaning that in natural phenomena, only one outcome must happen given the existing conditions. On the other end, it is an epistemological principle that requires science to describe phenomena in such a way that the real case is univocally determined, meaning that the theory, the model, point to the real outcome as something unique. So, while maintaining the criticism of causality provided by Fechner, Mach, and Avenarius, and their notion of functional relations, Petzl believes that we must add the fundamental principle of univocalness. It is not enough to say that there exist a functional relations among natural phenomena. We must also say that the functional relations are such that the phenomena are univocally and entirely and necessarily determined. There cannot be room for indeterminism for Petzold. And the univocal determination is the concept designed to wipe out any trace of indeterminism left by Fechner, Mach, and Avenarius. Now, with the univocalness principle, we have the second pillar of Petzl's philosophical system. So we can now move to the last one, which is a psychophysical parallelism. This topic is present throughout Petzl's career, but it, it becomes the main topic in the works that he publishes at the turn of the century, like the paper on the necessity and generality of a psychophysical parallelism. Of course, since we are talking of a follower of Ernest Mach, it shouldn't be a surprise that Petzl does not interpret the psychophysical parallelism in a metaphysical sense. So there aren't two different substances, the physical and the psychical related to each other. On the contrary, the physical and the psychical are just two different ways of regarding the same things, the same stuff, the same empirical phenomena. Experience per se is neutral, 
is neither physical nor psychical. It is beyond the separation and indifferent to it. So given that psychophysical parallelism is not meant in the metaphysical sense, what does it say? It says that the experience or more generally mental activity can be explained scientifically only in its dependency upon the brain, only as being univocally determined by the brain activity. This means that if I wanna know why I had a certain experience, a certain thought, a certain feeling at a given time, instead of one of the other endless possible ones that maybe I could have had, I must investigate the brain. The conditions of the brain are what determine univocally the mental phenomena. This means that according to Petzl, there is no mental causality whatsoever. No mental antecedent can cause a thought, can cause a feeling or an idea. So we must explain mental activity through brain activity. And by doing so, we can also provide a foundation for the law of univocalness, as I'm going to explain. We saw that for Petzl, natural phenomena, natural processes are univocally determined. This means that we, as organisms, live and evolve in this natural environment, in this univocally determined environment. Consequently, we evolve by adapting to a nature that is univocally determined. Of course, this evolution follows also the principle of tendency to stability that we already discussed. So we tend towards a more stable relationship with the environment by adapting to it. And in the course of this adaptation, we shape ourselves according to the univocal determination that characterizes nature. This means that our brain too is the result of a long evolution in such an environment. For this reason, the brain has been shaped according to an environment in which natural phenomena are univocally determined. Consequently, univocal determination is like embedded in our brains. Put another way, since univocal determination was a condition for the evolution of our brains, it is inscribed into their very functioning. It is a condition of their very existence. Therefore, the brain requires univocal determination. But since the principle of psychophysical parallelism states that all mental activity depends on the brain, mental activity too requires univocal determination. <clears throat> Consequently, our cognitive functions, our knowledge demand univocal determination. And this is the reason why knowledge regards nature in its univocal determination. The reason why science looks for univocal determination and expects nature to act according to univocal determination. And thus the circle is complete. Univocal determination is a request we make to the world, but it is so because it is primarily a feature of the world itself that gets therefore embedded into ourselves. We may say that for Petzl, the univocal determination is primarily a fact, a feature of nature, and consequently, it becomes a postulate, a condition of possibility of our knowledge, or even more precisely, a condition of possibility of the very existence of our brains that therefore demand the univocalness from the world in order to survive and see their demand fulfilled by nature. As you may notice, on this issue, Petzl reaches a totally anti-Kantian position because all Kantian philosophy regards the necessity of nature as a postulate, whereas Petzl rejects the Kantian assumption that we are like the lawgiver of nature. It is true that we must regard the nature in its necessity, but if we start from here, we are unable to explain why we need to regard nature in such a way? What is the root of this imperative? What is the source of the a priori forms of knowledge? Moreover, if we regard univocal determination, natural necessity as a sheer postulate, we are also unable to explain how happens that nature complies with our demand. Why nature meets our postulate? 
So we identified the three fundamental pillars of Petzold's philosophical system. And as we saw, they are intertwined insofar as psychophysical parallelism tells us that the knowledge depends upon the brain and the brain evolves according to the principle of stability in a world that is univocally determined. This means that the more we know nature in its univocal determination, the more we and our brain evolve by attaining a stable relationship with nature. Now, upon these three pillars, Petzold establishes his philosophical system, which he inserts names relativistic positivism. In particular, we first encountered this label in his most successful book, The Problem of the World from the Point of View of Relativistic Positivism, which had several editions over the years. Now, to understand what Petzold means by relativistic positivism, we must see what he means by positivism and relativism. According to Petzold, positivism is all philosophy directed against metaphysics. And by that, Petzold means especially against the metaphysical notion of substance as the never changing substrate of all things. On the other hand, he defines relativism as the philosophical position that is based on the rejection of the opposition between appearance and reality. So while Petzl's conception of positivism is quite straightforward, his idea of relativism may seem quite odd. So let's see further what he means by that. Petzl regards relativism as opposed to the traditional mainstream philosophy that according to him runs more or less below the surface throughout history, apart from some rare exceptions like Protagora. This mainstream philosophy is based on the distinction between a material substance and a mental substance, or whatever they are called, matter and mind, nature and soul, extension and thought, and so on. The point is that according to this view, in the world there are two radically different somethings. And this happens in modern philosophy too, with the distinction between world and representations. On the one hand, there is the real concrete world, and on the other hand, there is a, its a reflection in our consciousness. But since our representations may or may not represent reality faithfully, since representations are not reality, but just an image of it, they may contain mistakes, they may contain errors, like a sort of distorting mirror. And this leads to the opposition of reality and appearances. We only represent the reality in our own way, according to how our own mind and perceptive organs work. So representations are just appearances, the phenomena, like a veil of Maya that covers and hides the real features of the world. And as I already said, according to Petzl, this conception runs throughout the whole history of philosophy, up to Kant and also beyond. Kant philosophy implies the existence of reality as the thing in itself, and the existence of a mental substance as the I in itself, the I think. And even all attempts to go beyond Kant by getting rid of the notion of a thing in itself are still grounded in this dichotomy between the world and its representation, reality and appearance. And this is demonstrated by the fact that even if, if these philosophies claim to have overcome the notion of the thing in itself, of the true reality beyond representations, these philosophies still regard the representations as something subjective, as a product of the subject, of the self, or the soul, the guys, the, the I, the ego, or whatever they call it. So this is what mainstream philosophy believes according to Petzold. Now, the question is once more, what's relativism then? And how it opposes this traditional conception, this mainstream philosophy? For Petzold, the main idea of relativism is that my experience is not just a representation an image of the object. My experience is the object, but is, is the object in relation to me. But what matters is that the object in relation to me 
is not just some kind of second-hand distorted phenomenal reality. The object in relation to me is a full reality, precisely because there is nothing in itself. Everything in the world is in relation with everything else. So cognition, experience, knowledge is simply one kind of the many relations that exist in the world. And like every other relation, it must also be univocally determined. So the relation between the object and me is real and is univocally determined. And one consequence is that uh, properly, properly speaking, there are no appearances. There are, for example, no optical illusions, uh, no perceptual mistakes, uh, no veils of Maya, no unbridgeable gap between reality and my representation of it. For example, it makes no sense to say that uh, these two lines uh, in reality are of the same length, whereas they mistakenly appear as being different to us. Actually, there is no mistake and there can be no mistake because in natural phenomena, there are no mistakes. The whole idea that in the universe, something may appear different from what it is, is just absurd for Petzold. Everything happens for a reason. Everything happens according to the laws of nature. Everything is univocally determined and our experiences, our perceptions are no exceptions. We see the two lines having two different sizes because our eyes and brain function in a certain way. So our perception of the two lines being different is no mistake, is no illusion, is no appearance. It is real. It is real and necessary. So it is true that in relation to our perceptual apparatus, the two lines are of different lengths and it couldn't be otherwise. And it is true that in relation to a ruler placed next to them, they are of the same length and it couldn't be otherwise. The lines are both different and the same. And the two statements do not contradict each other. They would be contradictory only if they tried to state something about the lines in themselves, regardless of any relation. But of course, this is not the case for relativism. To give another example, there is no contradiction in one thing being different for two observers, like when one of the two person is colorblind, because it is univocally determined that according to their physiological constitution, they must perceive the object differently. One may say that the tree is green, while the other may say that the tree is gray, but they are both right insofar as they mean the tree in relation to me and do not pretend to claim something about the tree in itself, regardless of any relation. For this reason, they can also acknowledge the truth of the other person. There isn't like an unbridgeable gap that separates the experience of these two people. It makes no sense to say that one can never grasp the experience of the other, that each one is confined within its own representations. Because since perceptions and cognition are univocally determined, I know that a different person with a different body, a different brain and a psychological, physiological apparatus, this person must perceive and know things in a different way uh, than, than me. So for both observers, it is an objective reality that the thing is so and so in relation to me. And it is also an objective reality that it is so and so in relation to the other person. And it makes no sense to distinguish and juxtapose the real tree and the tree as it appears to us, reality and appearances. This kind of reasoning only ends up in duplicating reality and gives rise to all sorts of philosophical problems. By the way, it was this approach that was applied by Petzl to the theory of relativity, because according to this kind of relativism, the fact that two observers measure time and space differently has nothing to do with appearances. 
Space and time dilations are not just appearances. It is not that time or space appears contracted to the moving observer. An event actually has a certain duration for an observer at rest and a different duration for an observer traveling at a relativistic velocity. Or a rod actually has a certain length for an observer at rest and a different length for an observer traveling at relativistic velocity. And there is no contradiction between the two statements that claim different times and different lengths. Because there is no time and space in themselves, there is no absolute space and there is no absolute time. But as we saw earlier, the fact that different observers will measure space and time differently doesn't lead to skepticism or solipsism because what every observer will measure is univocally determined. It is univocally determined that an observer traveling at a certain speed will measure time and space differently. And therefore, we also know, we may even calculate what the person traveling at a relativistic velocity will measure. In this case, the means of determination that allow the univocal determination are Lorentz transformations, which allows us to calculate what must be measured from each different standpoint. Again, so relativism is no skepticism once we have univocal determination. Once we maintain the necessity of natural processes that also determines all relations. So when Einstein endorsed Petzold, he was agreeing with this idea that relativity goes beyond the dichotomy of reality and appearances and with the idea that uh, insofar as we maintain univocal determination, relativism doesn't fall back uh, into a form of skepticism. However, as I said at the beginning, the main topic of my talk is not the Petzold role in the debate about relativity. I want to show that Petzold may help us understanding Mach. So now we should see how this relativism provides an uh, interpretation of Ernest Mach philosophy. I refer in particular to Mach's notorious claim that the object is a bundle of sensations that has given rise to all sorts of interpretations throughout the history of philosophy. However, Petzl believes that we shouldn't read this statement as meaning that the object in itself is a bundle of sensations, as if the objects are made of sensations which would imply to fall back on a sort of subjective idealism or immaterialism like the one defended by Berkeley. According to Petzold, when Marx states that the object is a bundle of sensations, he means two things. That the object in relation to me is a bundle of sensations and that there is no object in itself. Moreover, it doesn't mean that the sensation are a subjective appearances. On the contrary, it means that the sensations are an objective reality. Since the object in relation to me is the object, sensations are objective. So considering everything I said, we can now specify what relativism is and what it is not. Contrary to what one might think, Relativism is not a form of subjectivism. Relativism doesn't claim that we only know what appears to us, that we only know the appearances. Secondly, it is not a form of skepticism. For Petzl, relativism doesn't claim that we can never know the reality. And lastly, relativism does not imply solipsism. It doesn't claim that we are stuck with our representations and that there is no bridge towards the experience of other people. On the contrary, relativism is a form of positivism because it claims that the object in relation to me is real. It is not just a shadow, a representation, a sheer phenomenon. Because since everything is related to everything else, then to know relations means to know the world. In other words, true positive knowledge is relative knowledge. Or rather, there is no knowledge 
other than the knowledge of relations. So the strive for the things in themselves is just bad the metaphysics. We should get rid of this impossible and meaningless quest for the substance that is supposed to be the substrate of all relations. We should get rid of these ideas once and for all. And finally, petrol relativism claims that all relations are not arbitrary, are not random. On the contrary, they are necessary, univocally determined. So knowing the relations in a, in a way is attaining a stable knowledge of the world. It is not like falling into chaos with things that come and go and change constantly without a reason. It is natural, it is healthy to want the world to be stable because of course we need stability. But this stability is not the stability of the metaphysical substance of a supposed never changing substrate that underlies all changes and all relations. On the contrary, it is the stability of the law of univocalness that governs all changes and governs all relations. Now, maybe some of you are thinking that uh, after all, petrol relativism is actually pretty close to most post-Kantian philosophy that he kind of agrees with the idealist philosophers. After all, they all wanted to get rid of the thing in itself. They all claimed that the phenomena are the reality and they all claimed that we cannot know reality independent of ourselves. And in fact, Petzold acknowledges these similarities. In one of his books, at one point, he even jokes about it and says that an idealist might accuse him of stealing his job. But there is at least one fundamental difference. The difference is that the idealist philosopher claims that since we cannot know reality independent of ourselves, then it must follow that reality depends on ourselves. And that's the point where Petzold disagrees with the idealism. For Petzold, reality does not depend on ourselves. All the more so because, properly speaking, there is no such thing as selves. And that's the second fundamental point of disagreement with the idealist philosophers and more generally with the traditional mainstream philosophy. There is no such thing as a philosophical subject, an I, the self, or whatever we want to call it. And that's why the transition after Kant for Petzold is incomplete, because Kant and post-Kantian philosophy tried to get rid of the material substance, tried to get rid of the thing in itself, of the idea of a true reality beyond the experience, but they couldn't fully achieve their purpose because they were stuck with the other elf of this dichotomy, with the I in itself, with the subject, with the residue of the idea of the mental substance. Their incorrect reasoning was uh, there is no thing in itself, then everything must fall on the back of the subject. According to Petzold, we must get this point to understand what is so revolutionary of the philosophy of Ernest Mach. If we interpret Mach's claim that the object is a bundle of sensations in a subjective sense, we have not made a step beyond all the philosophy of the 19th century. Mach becomes just another finger that tries to get rid of the thing in itself, like Kant himself did and all the philosophers after him. So the point of Machian philosophy is to get rid of the subject-object dichotomy altogether, so that when we reject the notion of the thing in itself, we don't fall back into subjectivism. And to get rid of the subject-object dichotomy, we must get rid of the self. We must get rid of the subject. Of course, already Hume criticized the traditional unitary notion of the self, and he took a step in the right direction for Petzold. But Hume still regarded the representations in a subjectivist sense, thus proving that he was still thinking into the framework of the subject-object dichotomy. So to sum up in a nutshell, the shift from Kantian and post-Kantian philosophy 
to the new philosophy defended by Mach and Petzold, we should say that after Kant, the I, the subject, is the cornerstone of all knowledge. Whereas on the contrary, Marx states that we must get rid of the I. As he famously said, we cannot save the I. The sich ist unrettbar. This passage is well known, but I want to read it anyway. The primary fact is not the ego, but the elements, sensations. The ego is not a definitive, unalterable, sharply bounded unity. This content and not the ego is the principal thing. This content, however, is not confined to the individual. The ego must be given up. So this means not only that there is no ego as some sort of particular super content that is related to all other contents. This also means that content themselves, elements themselves are not subjective, are not something that belongs to a subject, a self, a consciousness, an individual, and so on. So again, when Macher claims that the object is a bundle of sensation, this doesn't imply that there is an I, an ego that perceives these sensations, that there is a self, a subject, a consciousness having these sensations. For example, when one says, I see an apple, it doesn't mean that the I, the ego sees the apple. It doesn't mean that there is a subject having the bundle of sensations uh, apple. Rather, it means that there is a functional relation between the apple, the eye, and the brain, which are all elements of the world, neither objective nor subjective. So to make the real step further in philosophy and go beyond the sterile opposition between subject and object, it is not enough to get rid of the thing in itself, like all philosophy after Kant did. We must get rid of the subject too. This is the real step forward made by Mach. And unless we really get to this point, we will continue to misinterpret him as a phenomenalist, as a subjectivist, as a thinker that wanted to make the concrete world dissolve into sensations. So I hope to have explained what Petzl meant with the relativistic positivism and how this relativistic positivism was supposed to express and develop the main core of the philosophy of Ernest Mach. But let me briefly sum up the most important points of Petzl's worldview before I make my final point. The world in itself is neither matter nor consciousness, neither subject nor object. Everything in the world is related nothing is in itself. So there are no underlying substances beyond all the relations. And to know the world is to establish certain relations to it. In particular, knowledge depends on the brain evolving towards increasingly stable relations with the world. Therefore, our brain constantly adapts to the world being shaped by the world of features. So since the world is univocally determined, our brain evolves according to univocal determination and needs univocal determination for its own survival. And therefore, the more we know the world in its univocal determination, the more we, which means our brain, establish a stable relationship with it. So we can now come back to this slide and we now know what was the philosophy of Petzold. So we are able to get what he had or had not in common with Bach, what they agree and what they did not agree upon. And moreover, this comparison is made easier by all the documents that we have where they discuss with each other. Obviously, I cannot cite them here. However, I am referring to passages of their works where Mach discusses Petzold or Petzold discusses Mach, but I'm referring also to their extensive correspondence. However, if we compare their philosophy and read the documents where they discuss with each other, it's easy to identify what they did or did not agree upon. First of all, it is clear that the major element of disagreement is the fact that Petzold 
aimed at establishing a philosophical system. It is well known that Mach always said over and over that he was not a philosopher and that there is no Machian philosophy. He didn't aim at establishing a conclusive set of philosophical position. So if there is something like a Machian philosophy, it is not a set of fixed beliefs. Rather, it is a philosophical attitude. And moreover, Mach's attitude was all about having an historical critical approach and constantly questioning all fixed beliefs. Mach was wary of every thinker, philosopher or scientist that had the pretension to say something definitive about anything. Therefore, obviously, he couldn't share Petzl's attempt to establish a positive, definitive philosophical system. And this uh, different attitude is also behind their second major disagreement regarding the law of univocalness. We saw that Petzold explicitly declared that his univocalness principle was meant to go beyond Mach because Mach had allowed a certain degree of indeterminism into his worldview. So it is clear that Mach didn't agree with Petzold on the idea that natural phenomena are necessarily and entirely determined. <clears throat> of course, these two differences are not just minor details. They mean two fundamentally different philosophical styles. However, this doesn't mean that Mach and Petzl didn't share plenty of their ideas. After all, Petzl considered himself a follower of Mach and Mach himself acknowledged Petzl as his pupil. They, as I said, they had a long personal relationship and an affectionate correspondence. And we may say that things would have been different had Mach believed that Petzl was like exploiting his name to pursue philosophical goals that he didn't share. So we may ask ourselves what they did agree upon. In particular, they agreed on the necessity to go beyond the dichotomy of subject and object, ego and world, physical and psychical. And moreover, they both wanted to reject the notion of thing in itself without falling back in the subjectivism or idealism of most post-Kantian philosophy. In particular, since Marx claimed that the objects are bundle of sensations uh, was constantly misinterpreted as a form of subjective idealism or immaterialism or phenomenalism, Petzl took up the task to defend Marx's position from this kind of misinterpretations. Let me just give a striking example. There are various letters where Petzl discusses with Marx of the philosopher Wilhelm Schuppe that was a representative of the so-called philosophy of immanence and had personal contacts with both Petzold and Mach. In one of these letters, Petzold writes the following. I assured Schuppe that you are not an idealist, nor a subjectivist, nor a psychomonist or similar, but a true positivist. He was not sure about that since in the analysis of sensations, you describe the elements of the world as sensations, by which is often meant something merely subjective. But as I said, this letter is a testimony of a recurring situation. Mach was, and often still is, regarded by many as a subjectivist, a psychomonist, a phenomenalist. So Petzl became his public defender on this issue, and Mach let him become his public defender. Unlike the case of the frequent disagreement of, on the topic of univocalness, there is not a single word where Mach distances himself from Petzold on this topic. So in this case, regarding this topic, we can use Petzold to shed light on Mach. So let's sum up Petzold's interpretation of Mach regarding the issue of how to interpret the claim that the objects are bundle of sensations. It should not be interpreted as if Mach was trying to project the sensations onto the world, as if the object in itself is a bundle of sensations, or as if the object is made of sensations, as if sensations are some sort of stuff that constitutes the world. On the other hand, 
we should neither interpret Marx's statement as a way of projecting the world onto the subject in an idealistic sense. By calling the object a bundle of sensations, Marx doesn't mean that the object is a subjective appearance. And he is neither advocating in favor of the philosophical view that we are stuck with our representations, with our sensory experience, and have no grasp of reality. Mach means that the object in relation to me is a bundle of sensations, and that there is no object in itself, no object given regardless of any relation. Moreover, the object, which is the bundle of sensations, is not just an appearance, it is a reality. The object in relation to me, it's real. It's not just an appearance. It's not just a representation. It is as real as everything that it is real. And last but not least, when we speak of the object in relation to me, this me, it's not meant in a subjectivist sense as the self, the I, the subject, the I think, or whatever. Because there is no I, there is no self. The object in relation to me is the object in relation to my hand, my eyes, my brain. Sensations are functional relations between objects and my body. Sensation is the name we give to a functional relations between elements of the world and our physiological organism. So sensations are a natural phenomenon that connects certain elements of the world. They are not a subjective status. They are not events in our consciousness. So for Petzold, if we interpret Mach otherwise, if we interpret Mach as a phenomenalist, we don't understand the novelty of his philosophical position. It is not enough to just claim that he got rid of the thing in itself, because this was the goal of all post-Kantian philosophy. And in a sense, it was already implied in Kant's philosophy. So Mach's position cannot be just, uh, let's get rid of the thing in itself and uh, identify the object with the sensory experience. The point is to get rid of the thing in themselves without falling back into subjectivism, without putting the entire burden of knowledge upon the subject. In Mach philosophy, it is not the world that evaporates. It is the subject, the self that evaporates. Instead of the self, of the subject as the lawgiver of the world, we have a world where everything is in relation to everything else. And perceptions, sensations are just one example of the many relations that exist in the world. So the big difference between Mach and Petzold is that for Petzold, these relations are also univocally determined, whereas Mach leaves room for a certain degree of indeterminism. Otherwise, they agree on how to conceive the world and our role in it. And therefore, Petzold helps us understanding Mach. So I have now reached the end of my talk and thank you for listening. However, before moving on to your question or the discussion, I want to recap the core of my presentation. A possible alternative title for my talk could have been Machian philosophy and post-Kantianism so close and yet so far, because Mach's theory of the object as a bundle of sensations may seem similar to post-Kantian efforts to get rid of the thing in itself in favor of representations. However, that's where our man Petzold comes into play, because his systematization of Machian philosophy in direct opposition to traditional mainstream Kantian philosophy helps us avoiding this mistake. He helps us to make clear that for Mark, the world is not our representation. The subject is not the alpha and omega of all knowledge. On the contrary, we are just a physiological organism in relation to the world, and our sensations are an example of such relations. So for this reason, I hope you now think that it was worth to spend 90 minutes working on this Petzl guy. And thank you again, and uh, I look forward uh, with uh, the discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Chiara Russo-Kraus. 
thank you for a brilliant exposition and for the very fine slides. One day I will be able to do slides so beautiful as yours. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, having the opportunity to discuss philosophy, even if remotely, with this year's participants of our meeting. The situation we have here this year is far from ideal, but it can also be an opportunity to try some different interactions between researchers and students. Uh, so let me begin by stating that despite Professor Mario's wishes and nomenclature, I won't debate Professor Russo Kraus or dispute the interpretation of Petzl, since this is the only one I, and I believe most of us, are I'm aware of. Uh, it's I'm, I'm getting to know uh, Petzl uh, really for the first time. I have encountered him in Kassira, uh, I remember Reichenbach, but never read uh, Petzl. Instead, uh, what I will do is I will present some brief comments on Professor Scrow's Carl's presentation, or more precisely, motivated by her talk, that will have to do not with some questions on the history uh, that will have to do with some questions on the history of 19th and early 20th century philosophy, its relation to science and its reach on true contemporary philosophy. Also, since we unfortunately, we unfortunately cannot have questions by the listeners, I will express some of my own questions concerning a name which is certainly not a staple of the philosophical canon and present some uh, and those questions certainly arise from my previous unfam unfamiliarity with uh, Petzl. First, I would like to point that, although we now are sure why it is important to study this Petzl guy, maybe it is relevant to ask why you should care not only about this Petzl guy, but also about the Herberts, Trendelenburg, or lots of guys, or for that matter, about Frege or Mack. As those who regard regularly attend our annual meetings are aware by now, one of the common denominators of our research work is the conviction that any sharp divide between history of philosophy on one hand and philosophy to court on the other hand is the result most of the times of ignoring this history of philosophy and believing that real philosophy is to respond to the later paper on mind or synthesis. There are many reasons for this conviction, one of, them be, uh, one of them being that, unaware of history, many philosophers employ concepts, tools, vocabulary, vocabulary and access problems that are the di direct result of the historical development of philosophy. View it not as a disparate array of authors and theses, but as an organic development that, although not, although not linear, can be shown to have a sense and internal motivations. Remember, for instance, how Professor Rufino pointed out yesterday, commenting on, uh, Professor Rufino uh, pointed, commenting on Professor Simon's presentation, the implicit Frigian assumptions on much of contemporary philosophy of language and logic. That's particularly true about 19th century philosophy, which seems to be too close to us to be history and too distant to be uh, uh, philosophy or uh, the reverse. But in fact, many, if not most of our philosophical problems are a direct consequence, not to say a direct continuation of discussions and questions that arose and took a form and took form very close to the contemporary one during the 19th century. Those philosophers discussed, for instance, the relation between science and philosophy and the other science of, of spirit or the authority of science, like we do now. They were engaged in championing or fighting uh, the authority of, of science in our knowledge of reality and the ontologically materialist and methodological naturalist worldview, just like uh, we do. They were discussing the meaning of the mind-body problem and challenged the assumptions of a, of a priori explanations of the world. They were worried about the relativistic and ultimately skeptical consequences of subjectivism or idealism, idealism. Or, on the contrary, they were happy to embrace those consequences, just like we do now, and just like Petzl or many other 19th century philosophers did. But those philosophers are important not only because the problems they bequeathed to us, but also because of the answers they gave <clears throat> and because of the framework in which those, those answers were given. 
knowing that framework can give us a sense of both the limits and reach of our contemporary way of doing philosophy. That said, I would like to point some aspects of that framework before uh, getting into specific questions. One distinctive trait of 19th century philosophy is the positive engagement with science, not as a continent with metaphysics like in Descartes or in 18th century philosophy, but as a body of knowledge distinct from philosophy of knowledge, and that must be taken as the that must be taken as the starting point, making the treasure of common knowledge the preferred ob object for philosophical or transcendental reflection. If one aspect of the Copernican revolution is, as pointed out, as pointed out by Prof, as pointed out by Professor Russo Krauss, the separation between things in, in itself and the knowing subject. Another positive aspect of the Copernican revolution is this acceptance of the factum of science as a starting point for philosophy, or at least for logic and epistemology, uh, Wissenschaftslehre. Uh, but this happens precisely, this uh, historical change in philosophy happens precisely when a novel conception, in fact, many novel conceptions uh, of science are being elaborated in response to what was called here by Professor Krauss, the second scientific revolution. As it is known, although inspired by Newtonian science, Kant adhered, uh, like all the philosophers of his time, to what we can call, like uh, the, home, the, the Young and Betty did in a famous article, the classical model of science. This model sees science as a kind of universal and necessary knowledge that is, as, that is at its best when articulated in the form of an axiomatic deductive system. In the face of the tremendous growth and diversification of the empirical science in the 19th century, that conception can no longer be easily adopted or justified. As I myself argued in the talk in talks of the previous editions of uh, this very meeting, we can speak, in fact, of not one, but of many scientific revolutions during the 19th century. I presented here, for instance, the consequences of projective geometry for Kantian philosophy of mathematics, or how the development of the theory of, the theory of heat and thermodynamics in Joule, Carnot, and Kelvin, Thompson, challenged the deterministic and necessary character of physical law. Not by chance, I did this using my book on the subject. Professor Porter did the same with the rise of electromagnetism and filter re theory and its reception in new Kantianism. So I was saying that because I cannot agree more when I hear that in order to know someone's philosophy, we must know what questions drove him, not what he said or what were, uh, was his philosophy or what he defended. And that question, answered here by Professor Krauss for Petzl, is in fact the necessary initial question for any philosopher. We've seen that in a certain sense, being a neo-Kantian and agnostic was pretty, much, was pretty much a logical consequence of the environment, influence, and starting points at work on Petzl, namely the also German scientific and philosophical uh, heritage of Mack, Avenarius, Fechner, and others, like Herbert and, uh, well, Oh, we can go back uh, before that. Now, uh, uh, passing to the more specific considerations, I would like to discuss some of the contents of personal philosophy presented here in order to understand them better and to place them in the more general context of the discussion about the 19th and early 20th century philosophy or about the origins of contemporary philosophy. So, uh, I want the, the, I won't go into detail, but I will do some considerations and uh, ask some questions that uh, arise uh, from those considerations. Concerning Petzl, two principles. The first one, the principle of the tendency towards stability or minimal disruption, is easily understood in the context not only of its Fechnerian and Machian or origins, but also in the wider scientific context of the times. Speci spe uh, specifically, if we uh, consider the field of thermodynamics. Similar claims, for instance, can be found in all the main figures of, this, of its history, from Kelvin to Joule and Sadikane, or even in Helmholtz. Uh, and the example of the solar system 
uh, Professor Kara presented, uh, Kara Kraus presented us. Uh, cannot but remember uh, so the, the famous book by Lord Kelvin, by Thompson, uh, from 1852, on a universal tendency in the uh, in nature of the to the dissipation of mechanical energy. It was an idea that was on the air, and uh, it has a, 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 a we can uh, pinpoint its origin. However, this principle obviously, obviously has a very different value for Petzl, since first, it holds not only for the physical, but also for the mental. And secondly, by having an epistemological, that is a normative and not only descriptive role. I quote uh, Professor Krauss, because the principle of stability presents itself as a positive knowledge of the world, in the sense that it presents itself as a scientific generalization of the scientific of the real features of the world, not as some kind of regulative idea that only serves to organize our representation in Kantian agnostic sense. Moreover, the principle provides an entire understanding of the world. So if I understand, this means in Kantian slang, in Kantian jargon, that this principle is not is constitutive in relation to reality, not only regulative. But that cannot be right, since uh, uh, having no I nor subject, there is no one to constitute nothing. So my question here is how Petzold can justify this principle? Is it a generalization from experience itself, subject to correction and addition and addition through time in an evolutionary process? Let's say, it's a, is it a scientific proposition, or is it, uh, it's, or its grounds are to be found in another kind of philosophical or a priori, a priori justification? I understand that the principle is unitary in the sense that it bridges the gap between Fechner's ontological principle of stability and Mach and Avernarius epistemological ones, epistem epistemological principles. But being neither one of them, where does it find its foundation for Petzold? The second principle, uh, now I pass to the, 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 the second principle. The second principle, the law of univocalness, uh, is a little bit more odd, even by Austro-German standards. Uh, and uh, you explicitly stated that it was both uh, of them, but the same question can be asked about it. In short, my question is, my first question is, since it seems that those principles are not unprovable or evident axioms, nor mere generalizations, not mere description of facts, what kind of proof or justification does Petzold offer of them? That brings me to two other concepts that are always present in your exposition of Petzold, those of knowledge on the one hand and of relation or functional relation on the other. Uh, you, you can correct me after if I jump it to conclusions too fast. It seems to me that Petzl does not, he cannot operate with a standard conception of knowledge, be it justified through belief or uh, the movement by which a consciousness grasps an object different of itself uh, in thought or something akin of that. And maybe also of truth, since correspondence is just one particular case of relations. And, uh, I have found some hints which I will not uh, uh, assert uh, to, a, to a maybe pragmatic conception of truth, but uh, maybe I'm reading too much in what you said. I guess knowledge is a relation, a special kind of relation. And I, I also guess it is naturalistically understood, a biological product, with a product of no subject directed to, towards no object external to it or maybe not, and I'm totally wrong. So I would like if you can hear more about that, okay? And I'm going, I'm, I'm finishing here, uh, just about uh, five minutes, two minutes. And this brings me finally, to, it's my, my last point, my last uh, comment uh, or question, to the, to the constant, to relations of, or functional relations. As it, was, as it is well known, disagreements about the nature of relations, what they are and what kind they exist, are at the center of much of 19th century philosophy. Leibniz was maybe the first to clearly see the centrality of, the, a theory of, of a theory of relations, not only for metaphysics, but especially for mathematics, a cue that was eagerly followed by the young Russell. Russell, 
whose disagreement with the British idealists in the standard history of the birth of modern, of contemporary philosophy or analytic philosophy, is to be found precise, was to, uh, his disagreement with the British idealists was to be found precisely in the negation of external relations by Bradley, McTaggart, Bosanquet, etc. A negation Russell considered little for any attempt to secure the foundations of mathematics. It's the object of the internal external relations controversy by Russell. Relations are also at the core of the attempts by Schroeder at an algebra of logic, Bull, also, or in the work of Grasco. And clearly they are central for Petzl. Everything in the world is in relation to uh, everything else. I quote. Uh, uh, here. <clears throat> so relations uh, seem to be a kind of passepartout key that unlocks all the philosophical dichotomies in, in of old philosophy, matter and mind, reality and illusion, etc. as you show it us. But uh, I want to know how uh, does Petzl understand relations? Uh, what, uh, how does he define relation? What kind of, of, of uh, where does he find the ground for it? So if we look at, in Frege, relations are to be found uh, inspired by, by mathematics. If you look um, uh, to other authors, we can find relations as kind of uh, uh, to be found in the constancies of gen or generalities of nature. Where does a petzl uh, uh, take, so from where does petzl take his concept of relations? How does he understand relations? For, for it's, it's a absolutely central concept for me. Finally, to conclude, uh, uh, just a historical snippet uh, the, uh, concerning the, the second uh, principle, the, the univocalness principle. The term, uh, I don't, I, I don't think I, uh, is very usual in no counter jargon, uh, being used by Natorp uh, to characterize the singularity of intuitions. And by Cassir, for instance, in the part two of substance and function, uh, where he never quotes Petzl, but he quotes Mach. Mach. And uh, I, I went back to this, this text, and in fact, I'm sure now that Cassius uh, was thinking of Petzl when the, in, in this passage. But uh, Cassir also uses Eindeutigkeit when, discuss, uh, when discussing the synthesis of mathematics in his discussion of Kant's philosophy of mathematics, where he develops the idea of univocal coordination and univocal correlation to explain the capacity of singular figures to establish universal and necessary judgments. Uh, a triangle can be used as, a, as, an, as an instance of the of is an instance of the tr a triangle in general, and that uh, passes for uh, for uh, Cassir through the concept of uh, univocalness or univocal uh, univocal coordination or correlation. That made me realize that a singular absence in your presentation of uh, uh, an absence in your presentation of Petzl is mathematics, which is certainly an integral part of natural science in the 19th century today also, and I suppose at least a background for the discussion of the deterministic character, character of physical laws. So my last question here is, is there an explicit treatment of the foundation of mathematics uh, in Petzl, especially when dealing with univocalness and the concept of relation? Uh, uh, it's a pity that we cannot have a live discussion here because this is a, uh, my last point is a point that uh, could be developed better by, for instance, uh, Lucas Amaral, uh, one of our uh, uh, members of the, of the group, or by Professor Porter, but um, I, would, I, I wish to present it here also. Uh, I'm finished. Okay. <clears throat> So um, I will try to address uh, the question that you uh, pointed out. So uh, the first uh, regarding the question of uh, <clears throat> the principle of stability. Of course, uh, I didn't mention it, but uh, uh, it is uh, related uh, with uh, all the discussion about uh, the second principle of thermodynamics. Uh, and I think uh, it is uh, quite uh, interesting uh, and also quite odd. Uh, uh, we may say that uh, at the time, uh, when uh, it wasn't already very clear uh, all the implications uh, of uh, entropy, uh, there was this tendency in Fechner and in Petzl to kind of uh, use entropy as a sort of uh, scientific version of uh, finality, of uh, teleology. So because, uh, of course, entropy gives a direction uh, to the new universe, gives a direction to all processes, so it can be 
like the non-anthropomorphic uh, and scientific version of uh, finality. Then uh, I will uh, uh, in I will try to answer both the question regarding the foundation of the stability principle and of the uh, Eindeutigkeit principle at once because they are kind of the same question. So what is the justification? What is the foundation of these principles according to Petzold? Uh, he, uh, I, I tried to answer this question when I uh, pointed uh, uh, about uh, uh, the fact that, that they are both effect and a postulate because um, is, uh, they are kind of an axiom in this sense because they are of the uh, maximum generality. So in this sense, they are kind of axiomatic. We must presuppose that all processes, all phenomena act according to these principles, but they are also uh, justified and uh, uh, their foundation is empirical according to Petzold, but not empirical in the sense of a kind of a simple uh, inductive uh, reasoning, like uh, uh, we saw uh, a number of phenomena where, that were uh, univocally determined, and then we generalized uh, the principle of uh, Eindeutigkeit, uh, or we saw a series of phenomena uh, that evolved uh, towards the stability and then generalized the principle of stability. They are empirical in the sense that he says that our own existence, uh, our own existence is the proof that they are real. Because, uh, so uh, we may say it's kind of a uh, counter, um, uh, counter thinking, because if the world were not uh, uh, acting according to the principle of uh, univocalness. And if the world were not acting according to the principle of stability, then human minds, and this means human brains, were not possible. So the fact that uh, we have our brains and the fact that our brains act in this way and the needs uh, uh, stability and uh, andoitikeit is uh, a confirmation that uh, these are actual features of the world of the world. So, and uh, I repeat, uh, this is uh, uh, for me like uh, the very uh, anti-Kantian uh, aspect uh, of uh, of Petzl philosophy. This sort of uh, we may say uh, counter Copernican revolution. That uh, since we find this principle in ourselves, but uh, since we evolve in the environment. So the reason we have these things in ourselves must be that they are in the environment because we are a result of this environment thanks to the theory of evolution. I don't know if this kind of answers this question. So they are empirical and they are according to Pets or scientific proposition, but not empirical in the simple sense of a, a simple generalization from a series of uh, empirical observation, but uh, empir empirical because founded uh, in the very fact that uh, we are here, that we exist uh, and uh, are uh, so and so. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, the next uh, question was uh, regarding what uh, is uh, uh, Petzold concept of knowledge. Uh, maybe here, uh, the problem with my presentation is that uh, uh, we may consider knowledge uh, in, two, in two ways. Knowledge as uh, the direct knowledge of uh, the world. So the fact that for Petzold, uh, as I said, uh, when we see an object, uh, we don't see a representation. We see the object. It is the object. It is real. And this regards, uh, of course, uh, our empirical knowledge. But uh, he also has a, a, a concept of, we may say, a scientific knowledge in the sense that uh, uh, the quest for general notions or universal notion. So, for example, uh, there is a difference in these two concepts of knowledge because, as I said, according to the concept of empirical knowledge, I may say that the tree is gray, is gray and uh, a blind uh, color person may say the tree is gray. So we have uh, two different uh, notions, uh, two different uh, experience uh, 
of the tree. But of course, uh, there is another concept of knowledge that search for uh, universal and uh, interpersonal uh, valid uh, uh, concept. And this uh, uh, the tendency that uh, uh, brings uh, to, uh, of course, uh, science uh, and uh, this sort of things. And according to Petzold, this drive to is regulated by the law of stability because uh, every time we disagree uh, with one another uh, uh, about something, uh, this is like a disruption. So we must uh, look for uh, knowledge that may be shared by uh, the, uh, the most uh, part uh, of humanity. And this is the quest uh, that is beyond the science. So for example, uh, we uh, use uh, me measures because these uh, are uh, interpersonally valid and uh, allows us to bridge and go beyond these differences uh, in the empirical uh, in the empirical knowledge. And uh, also uh, about the topic of relations, uh, uh, what is uh, um, what is uh, uh, Petzold uh, idea of relations? Uh, I agree that is a kind of vague, and uh, I think that uh, to understand what he had in mind, the main point is that uh, to understand that uh, this concept of relation was uh, uh, a way to go beyond the, the trend in the history of philosophy that always look for uh, what is unrelated. The substance is not only what doesn't change, but also what doesn't have relation is unrelated, is per se and in se, to use a, a scholastic terminology. So the idea is that we don't have to look for the substrate of our relations, but we have to accept that the world is constantly different. Um, um, uh, if we uh, have a different relation with it. And I think that uh, the, the root of this idea is uh, in the philosophy of Herbert, uh, because uh, in Herbert uh, we had the idea that uh, uh, metaphysics uh, is uh, the need to have uh, like uh, uh, the, the reals uh, that are beyond all relations uh, that are in itself, but also the idea that all the properties of things are just relations uh, between uh, the, the different uh, metaphysical entities uh, that uh, exist in the world. So I think that uh, it's kind of uh, taking Herbert uh, and uh, taking away the metaphysics. So then you only have the idea that uh, all the properties of things are just uh, the consequence uh, of the meeting uh, of uh, different uh, uh, real entities uh, with one another. And uh, uh, even though um, Petzold doesn't arrive to this idea uh, through the reading of uh, Leibniz, uh, I also think that uh, it ends up being very similar to Leibniz and he recognized this uh, uh, similarity, but uh, only uh, towards the end of his uh, philosophy, because probably someone pointed out to it that uh, uh, they are similar in this sort. Of, uh, they, um, maybe we uh, would call it today a perspectivalism. So uh, the idea that uh, uh, these relations are different perspectives uh, on the object, uh, but they are uh, all real, they are all valid because uh, as uh, in the uh, perspectival geometry, there are uh, rules that regulate uh, the, these different perspectives. And uh, to the last question regarding the lack of mathematics, uh, an, easy an easy answer may be that uh, uh, Petzl was not that, uh, very good at mathematics. So he always complained in his uh, correspondence with Mach that uh, he is no good at it uh, and uh, it should have uh, studied more mathematics. But maybe a different uh, answer may be that uh, uh, in the 19th century, there are like these two trends. The one that uh, tried to explain uh, knowledge and mental activity by uh, resorting to biology and psychology. And then there is this other trend that uh, points more to uh, like mathematics and logic. Uh, we had an example in the uh, in the conference uh, we listened uh, yesterday, no? 
uh, all the Frege, Brentano, Bolzano, uh, Bolzano uh, uh, attempt to, uh, uh, what said uh, uh, Simon yesterday, uh, take uh, the thought uh, away from mind. So there is this trend that uh, they try to take the thought uh, uh, from mind, and there is this uh, other trend that uh, try to uh, um, take uh, the thought not only into mind, but also into the body, into the brain, into the uh, psychophysiological subject. And uh, of course, we know that uh, these trends are also uh, always, almost always opposed to each other with uh, all the uh, polemics uh, against uh, uh, psychologism. And I think that uh, there is a lack of mathematics in Petzl because uh, he is uh, uh, probably a proud member of this other trend that uh, resorts more to uh, biology and uh, psychology, we may say. Thank you uh, very much, Professor, uh, Professor Klaus. Uh, did Petzold read Spinoza? What? Uh, if he read Spinoza? I don't know if he read Spinoza, but Spinoza was a huge influence uh, on Avenarius. So uh, this uh, may be a sort of uh, indirect uh, influence. Uh, Avenarius started as a, a scholar of, uh, of Spinoza and his uh, uh, habilitation thesis was uh, on Spinoza, so this uh, might be the link. Uh, the video froze, so I don't know. Uh, I don't uh, listen to the answer. Uh, Professor Chiara? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that uh, Ernesto's connection may have uh, broken okay, down. We so, <laughs> I don't know if he's coming back soon. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, thanks for the incredibly brilliant talk. It was very interesting. I like it a lot. And, yeah, let, let's just wait a couple of minutes to see if Ernesto can uh, come back or otherwise uh, it's already, uh, we are already out of time. So I guess that's all. But, yeah, but thanks a lot for the... Mm -hmm. And thank you again for, for inviting me. <laughs> no, but it's, it was great. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. And so I guess that's all when we end the conference here then. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.